Hi all, this week we'll be talking about some criticisms of some of the theories of the moral status of animals that we've covered so far, which can broadly be broken up into utilitarianism and uh, deontolo deontological, utilitarian and deontological theories of the moral status of non-human animals. So for this class, uh, we'll be talking about utilitarianism, contractualism, and demandingness, a fantastic paper by Allison Hills in which uh, she will be claiming that while Ashford has made significant progress defending utilitarianism from the charge that it is too demanding, her argument will be both Act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism are committed to extremely strict duties to wild animals. Therefore, utilitarianism is even more demanding than is commonly realized. Therefore, it is more counterintuitive than its major rivals, um, contractualism or, or deontology might be another rival here. Um, so today we'll be talking about this argument from Hills. Uh, and then we'll also be talking about Cohen's argument that um, that animals do not deserve rights. So this, so Hills is pre presenting a problem with the utilitarian view that non-human animals deserve equal moral consideration to human beings, and Cohen will be presenting the argument that. Um, Regan's view that animals deserve rights is problematic. So this week we get challenges to the theories. All right, so why should we think that utilitarianism is too demanding? Well, first, let's look at the demandingness objection as it's usually spelled out. So utilitarianism requires that we maximize happiness and that's the utility principle, and that we be strictly indifferent when it comes to whose happiness we increase. So that's the principle of equality. In the current state of the world, there are millions who are so poor that their basic needs for food, shelter, and medical care are not met, who are so poor or who are affected by, um, by famine or uh, by the current pandemic that uh, their basic needs are not met. It's easier to bring these people out of suffering than it is to bring ourselves a commensurate increase in happiness. So this premise just says, and by the way, these should be numbered one through four instead of eight through D. Um, this premise just expresses the idea that if somebody's suffering terribly, then it's easier to bring them uh, quite a ways out of suffering than it is if somebody's relatively happy to increase their happiness. So it gets harder to increase units uh, the happier somebody is. So um, in this class, we've talked about a scale from negative 10 being the worst suffering somebody could experience to 10 being the greatest joy somebody could experience and zero being a neutral state. If somebody's starving to death, they're probably at a negative 10. It wouldn't take uh, much of an investment of resources to bring them from a negative 10 up to being pretty happy. So even if we were talking about bringing them up to zero where they're not feeling um, suffering anymore, then that would be a 10 point swing. Whereas if you're sitting at you know a one, you're pretty content generally, um, and you're thinking about using the same resources like paying $10 to see a movie instead of giving that starving to death person a meal, well, that might bring you up a couple points, but note the difference, uh, two points versus 10 points, right? So it's easier to have a bigger effect on happiness with people who are suffering terribly, bringing them out of that suffering instead of the marginal gains you would get um, by trying to increase a contented person's happiness. So therefore, uh, if we're going to maximize happiness, and it doesn't matter whether we're increasing somebody else's happiness or our happiness, what we're looking for is the greatest net gain in happiness. Um, and if it's easier to, to bring that greater net gain by helping other people, then utilitarianism would require that we work full time to alleviate the suffering of those uh, suffering from extreme poverty, uh, 
This might entail straining our relationships, our close relationships, and abandoning what uh, Bernard Williams calls our ground projects. So why might utilitarianism Im imply that? Uh, let's flesh this out a little bit. So if it's easier to affect uh, overall happiness by helping those, by giving our resources to those who are suffering horribly, then, um, and it, it'd be better, not only should we do that once, but whenever we run the calculus for any of, any of the actions that we're thinking about doing, it would always be best to do the work, to make the money, to give it to those who are suffering horribly, rinse and repeat. And while that might end up causing you, uh, a, you know, a, a not insignificant amount of unhappiness, um, there will be benefits for other people that will far outweigh the unhappiness that you experience. So, um, and this is to the extent that even those projects that you take to be part of your identity, like say you're a musician and you're learning um how to play some, in you have a hobby and it's uh, learning to play an instrument. You're not making money doing that uh, unless you're, you know, pretty famous or found a nice niche for yourself. Um, you should abandon that ground project and work more and give more to people suffering from extreme poverty. Um, is so that you might define yourself, it might be part of your identity being a mu musician, but utilitarianism would entail if you're trying to maximize happiness, who's getting happiness out of your project of learning how to play a guitar? You are, uh, maybe one or two other people, but you could be pulling people out of extreme poverty um, and, and starving to death instead of learning how to play guitar. So you should always be doing that. So that's pretty demanding. Um, that requires uh, us to perform more um, uh, unselfish actions than we normally think we're required to do. So utilitarianism on, on this analysis breaks down the distinction between charity and obligation. When we give to these people, it's not something that we should be praised for doing, um, but is optional so that we shouldn't be blamed if we don't do it. If utilitarianism is right, then we should be doing, we should be giving to the point of marginal utility to those who are suffering from extreme poverty all the time. And if we don't do it, we should be blamed for it. So again, pretty demanding, much more demanding than our common sense uh, moral views. All right, but some recent work on utilitarianism has tried to defend it from this objection. Elizabeth Ashford has, uh, has reasoned that while utilitarianism is demanding in the current state of the world, because there's so many people uh, in extreme poverty, so many people who are going to be starving to death or going to die horrible deaths because they lack medical care um, or don't have shelter, uh, so utilitarianism is demanding right now. We would have to work full time to alleviate that suffering. She says there is a practically realizable state of the world in which it's not so demanding. So uh, if we could convince more people to adopt a utilitarian mindset, uh, adopt a utilitarian ethic, and give uh, to the people who are horribly suffering in an attempt to maximize happiness, well, then we might get to a place, uh, especially if we could get uh, utilitarian principles legislated, we could get laws in place so that people um, did more. Then we could come to a place eventually where there wouldn't be uh, nearly as many people starving to death, and we could Maybe we could get to a place where there was nobody starving to death or nobody dying from uh, preventable causes um, that things like healthcare, shelter, or food uh, could prevent. Uh, 
So while we're not there now, it's at least conceptually possible and practically realizable. I mean, it's really just a problem of resource distribution um, and we could solve that problem. So maybe not so demanding. Uh, then her next point is that the suffering of the extremely poor constitutes an emergency in that their vital interests are threatened. So people who don't have food, uh, don't have adequate uh, medical coverage, don't uh, have shelter, they're gonna die. Um, and their, so their vital interests are threatened. And when people's vital interests are threatened, that's an emergency. That means that's something we need to deal with right now. If uh, a house was on fire and somebody was about to die, uh, that's an emergency. We need to handle that before we go out and see our movie, right? If we saw that happening on the way to seeing a movie, we think this needs to be dealt with before uh, we go see this movie. Um, Peter Singer has a famous example here where if there was a child uh, face down um, in a pool and you were walking by with expensive shoes on, um, wouldn't you be obligated, wouldn't you think that you were obligated, wouldn't you think that somebody else in that situation would be obligated to save the child at the expense of their shoes? And why is that? It's because somebody's vital interest would be threatened. The baby in that thought experiment, the extreme poor in this world. And emergencies require immediate action. It's not something we should think is okay to put off till later time. So uh, these are the two premises in Ashford's response to the demandingness objection. So if we could convince more people to be utilitarian, then we could realize a state of the world in which we would, uh, our moral obligations would not be so demanding. Once everybody has enough food, shelter, and medical care, well, now we can go out and buy our TVs. Now we can go out and, uh, and see movies. Now we can uh, engage, now we can pick up an instrument and learn it, right? And secondly, when people's vital interests are threatened, that's an emergency and we need to deal with it immediately. So utilitarianism is appropriately demanding, she might say, not too demanding. It's exactly as demanding as the situation calls for. All right, uh, the issue that Hills is gonna bring up here is that, okay, that's all great. Maybe we can solve the, hum the demandingness of utilitarianism regarding our obligations to humans. But now we also have to add in the utilitarian view of our obligations to non-human animals and, and their moral status. So according to utilitarianism, we're obligated to maximize happiness, all beings' happiness considered equally. Again, the principle of utility, the principle of equality. Happiness is defined as pleasure and the absence of pain Therefore, the pleasure and pain of non-human animals is factored into the calculus and given equal weight to the pleasure and pain of humans. So if happiness is defined as simply pleasure in the absence of pain, well, pleasure who can feel pleasure in the absence of and the absence of pain? Who can feel pleasure in pain? Humans and non-human animals. And unless we add some other ad hoc principle, all that pleasure and pain goes into the calculus equally. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about decreasing the suffering of a human being or decreasing the suffering of a rat. Uh, those, all that, that suffering goes into the equation equally when we're talking about maxima, minimizing suffering, maximizing happiness. So therefore, non-human animals deserve equal moral consideration, meaning we should be just as concerned with preventing the suffering of rats, red deer, etc., as we are with preventing the suffering of humans. Now, on the face of it, that seems uh, like a nice corrective to the way common sense can view non-human animals, which is that uh, most non-human animals deserve almost no moral consideration or minimum minimal moral consideration. And those sorts of views lead to the atrocities we see in factory farming um, and, uh, you know, the use of animals for clothing, uh, entertainment, etc. cetera. 
So, uh, at first glance, this, this seems like a nice corrective that utilitarianism can set us straight with regard to our obligations to non-human animals. The issue that Hills is going to bring up regarding this is our obligation to uh, wild animals. Um, wild in a sense. Uh, so let's look at what's going on with sewer rats first. So wild in the sense that um, nobody has uh, domesticated them. So uh, sewer rats can feel pleasure and pain. They're very sensitive creatures. In fact, they're empathetic creatures. Uh, if a mouse is given a choice between a piece of chocolate or saving a fellow mouse from drowning, the rat will actually save its fellow mouse from drowning. Um, but most importantly, they can feel pleasure and pain, which makes them deserve equal moral consideration on the utilitarian analysis. Uh, and that's great that rats are that way. Unfortunately, the rats in our cities are facing some pretty harsh conditions. There's a youth mortality rate of 99%. And there's an adult mortality rate of 90% due to predation, disease, and low temperatures in the winter. So rats are starving to death, freezing to death, or uh, being eaten to death in pretty high numbers uh, all over our major cities. And that is an emergency. Uh, according to utilitarianism. These rats, their vital interests are being threatened. And if rats deserve equal moral consideration to human beings, then we need to be equally concerned with that emergency as we are with people starving to death. And Hills points out, adopting a clan of mice would not take many resources. So instead of, uh, you know, 99 out of 100 of these rats, uh, starving to death or freezing to death, when winter comes around, we should take some in the house and make sure they're fed and warm enough and we can build a little mouse paradise for them. And that actually won't take many resources or even all that much effort. Uh, we just have to get enough mouse food for the winter. We'd have to take out their, um, their uh, waste um, but it wouldn't take too much effort. It certainly would take less effort than looking after a hundred human beings. Um, so that would be just for a winner. But imagine if somebody dedicated their life to looking after, feeding, sterilizing uh, sewer rats. One could allow hundreds or thousands to live pleasurable lives. So taking them out of a situation where they were something like a negative 10 uh, and bringing them to a situation where man, they're pretty content and happy all the time at like a constant five or something. What a, what a massive gain in overall happiness for the world. Now this obligation would be ongoing because somebody might say here, well, if you do that, then, uh, then the rat population will keep growing. Well, okay, now you just have more emergencies going on. So our obligation would be forever. Uh, I mean, we look after some rats, we have to keep doing that. Um, we should probably take some efforts to sterilize them so their population doesn't get out of control. Um, so we'd want a combination of saving them from the suffering they currently endure, uh, making sure they live happy lives, but also making efforts such making efforts um, towards population control so they don't end up um, starving to death, freezing to death, uh, etc. Look at another situation, the situation with red deer in the United Kingdom. So um, in the UK, uh, 312,000, 312,500 red deer live there. They have no natural predators. As a result of that, many of them starve to death. So if they're not being eaten, which is painful, but relatively short, then they're starving to death, which is painful and prolonged. 
not only are they suffering because of their uh, unchecked population growth, they're also causing considerable damage to forests by eating tree shoots and stripping bark. Uh, so that damages the environment uh, where other animals live, so that causes suffering to those other animals. And if you trained to be a highly competent deer stalker or finance the training of others, you could manage their population, preventing starvation of thousands and the ruination of environments for other uh, non-human animals. So what should the utilitarian do here? Well, they could do a lot of good, probably more, they could prevent more suffering here than if, they de if a utilitarian dedicated their life to this problem, then if a utilitarian dedicated their lives to preventing human suffering, because again, it takes many more resources to prevent human suffering. So uh, what should the utilitarian do here? They should kill as painlessly as possible as many of these red deer as would get them down to a manageable population size so that they're not starving to death, so that they have enough food, and so that uh, they aren't um, causing the suffering of other animals. Recall here that utilitarians are not in principle against killing non-human animals. Um, in fact, Peter Singer in some places has said that the killing of a non-human animal is not actually regrettable. It's just that there could be less pleasure in the world if there's one less creature in the world. Um, but if the animal's life is in the negative, if it's suffering, then removing it uh, from the equation would be better than it continuing. So uh, we have a big problem. All of a sudden we're saddled with ongoing, extremely stringent obligations to non-human animals, uh, specifically wild animals or animals that are not domesticated. We should be managing their suffering. Why? Because it's, their suffering counts just as much as human beings and it's much easier to mitigate their suffering. Um, now, Hills talks about some other objections to utilitarians here, um, objections to what the utilitarian utilitarians seem to be forced to recommending. So note Ashford's, uh, or sorry, not Ashford, Hills's strategy here is one we've seen pressed against utilitarians before. Utilitarians take their principles of utility and equality and say, apply these across the board. And somebody says, well, what about this circumstance? Aren't, doesn't this cut so hard against common sense? Now, a utilitarian can always say, well, so much for the worse for common sense. We utilitarians are right. But um, it becomes difficult to do that when we now have to manage, manage all of the suffering or as much as possible the suffering of non-human animals, not just the ones that we're domesticated and using, but wild animals as well. So environmentalists will say against utilitarians, um, utilitarianism may license the destruction of some species as a reduction of biological diversity is not necessarily bad. So these are other objections against utilitarianism, not the demanding this objection. Uh, and a, ut a strict utilitarian will think there is no intrinsic value in biological diversity. Now, if biological diversity is a necessary condition for the most amount of happiness, then biological diversity is valuable, but just um, instrumentally valuable to getting towards the most happiness. But uh, if we're spending so many resources saving the last few creatures of some species that could be better, uh, better spent elsewhere, like on rats, who cares how many of them are? There are. It's about increasing overall happiness, um, agent independent, right? Um, so in that case, the allowing a species to die or even destroying a species on the way to uh, maximizing happiness is what should be done, what we're obligated to do. Uh, you might think of uh, the predator-prey relationship here. If um, 
if we could eliminate predators and instead kill as harmlessly as possible uh, the the amount of prey that would um, be overpopulation such that they'd be starving to death, then we should do that. We should take that project on, right? Um, to have the maximum amount of creatures uh, feeling relatively content and happy. And that's objectionable to some environmentalists. Uh, again, another objection, utilitarianism will require considerable intervention in the natural world. Some environmentalists, environmentalists believe that the value of the natural world is partly based on the fact that it's untouched by human hands. So if we have to manage these predator-prey relationships, like imagine animals are about to be eaten by some predator, we should probably, uh, and say we had powerful uh, knockout serum that we could inject into them right before they were eaten, we should do that so they don't feel that pain of being eaten. Uh, but we'd be intervening in the natural world and environmentalists might, uh, would probably disagree with that. Some environmentalists will also argue that pain is a part of the natural world, so we should not try to reduce it. Since it's a natural occurring thing, its value lies, there's some intrinsic value in it being natural. So the natural being, uh, being a good in itself. Now there, I mean, a utilitarian will object to all of these. Um, they'll say the only intrinsic good is pleasure, the only intrinsic bad is pain. So uh, equating the natural with an intrinsic good is making a category error. All right, so how might a utilitarian respond to Hills's argument and how will she answer their responses? One way a utilitarian could go here is they could say the vital needs of animals do not count or that they count for much less than the vital interests of human beings, such that our personal projects would outweigh many of them starving to death. So uh, let's take a hundred rats. It doesn't seem very incredibly difficult for a human being to look after like a hundred rats, right? Um, so that your learning to play, my learning how to play guitar would uh, outweigh a uh, hundred rats starving to death. Um, Singer goes, a, for, for, um, for his sake, goes a little bit down this road. He'll say, uh, if we have to choose between a human being dying or a non-human animal dying, in most circumstances, we should choose the non-human animal dying. And why is that? He'll say human beings have interests that are extended in time. So we, uh, we think of our lives in a narrative way um, such that we can have projects that extend into the future where we'll say things like, oh, my relationship with my um, sister has deteriorated and I want to patch that up in the future. So we have a memory and, uh, and an imagination, which allows us to project in the future. Not clear, is that, not clear that non-human animals have that to the same extent that human beings do. So if you kill them, you're frustrating fewer of their interests than if you killed a human being. So we should prefer the lives of human beings to non-human animals. Now, you can grant his premise that if you have to choose between one human or one non-human animal that you should preserve the life of the human being. But what if you have to choose between a human being and their uh, trivial interests? Um, so not their life or death, but them playing the guitar and the non-human animals vital interest like uh, just staying alive, eating, having shelter, uh, not experiencing um, a tremendous amount of pain. Uh, well, then it seems that Singer would have to relent and say, well, in that case, we need to look after the hundred rats and their well-being. So uh, a problem with a uh, utilitarian who'd want to take a hard line on the um, non-considerability of non-human animals 
it seems that they would just be adding that to get around this problem. So it's ad hoc. It's like an after the fact addition um, to just try to solve this issue. And that doesn't seem principled and utilitarians above all want to be principled in their, um, in their moral considerations. And it also would lose much of the appeal of utilitarianism. So utilitarians uh, tout it as a virtue of their theory that they're indifferent to whose suffering or whose pleasure, um, whose suffer we're trying to mitigate, whose pleasure we're trying to maximize. And the fact that they, that they say we have more obligations than common sense would initially lead us to believe to non-human animals, that's a virtue of their theory. And we lose that if we say they don't count. And it's ad hoc to say they, it would seem weird to say that they count for much, so much less that many of them starving to death is worse than us not learning to play guitar. Another uh, possible way that a utilitarian could respond here is we don't know how to intervene in the natural world. Natural world is complex and affecting it might have unforeseen consequences. So we eliminate the wolves in an area and now the sheep are allowed to uh, flourish. Now we could run into that red deer problem where we need to control the population of deer. But it seems that there are some clear cases and we should also put our resource into learning what would be the effective ways of intervening to prevent suffering. We'd have an obligation to do that. The clear cases would be say there is a rat who's freezing to death. That intervention would be fairly clear, right? Um, we could prevent it from freezing to death if we knew it was freezing to death and suffering from it um, and give it a happier life than it would have in its very short amount of time left on this earth, right? Um, so that response won't be adequate or the utilitarian response won't be adequate. Another one, um, a utilitarian could say, well, if, if your theory is right, Allison Hills, we would have a permanent emergency situation on our hands. Why is that? Well, because unlike human beings, we can rationalize and use language. We can use our rationality and use language to communicate and to help solve each other's problems and come together to, to create solutions that will um, be better for all or most people. Animals can't organize in that sort of way. Um, they lack our higher, uh, higher mental capacities and they can't use language to communicate as, um, as efficiently as human beings can. Although that some, of, some animals might have some of the higher mental capacities and might have some access to language that we do, uh, it's clear that most adults have much higher, uh, um, more advanced mental capacities and more advanced capability to use language. So we might be able to solve our problems. This goes back to Ashford's defense of utilitarianism. Uh, there is a practically realizable state of the world where human beings might solve our issues, solve our distribution, resource distribution problems, and prevent uh, a tremendous amount of suffering. But a uh, wolf and sheep, they're not going to be able to get together and discuss how they might work together to minimize suffering. It would be great if they could. The wolves could say, look, we need to eat this amount to maintain our numbers. The sheep might say, look, if, we, if our population grows too much, then that actually leads to a bunch of us starving to death. So we need to offer as tribute to you wolves a certain amount, and they can even run. Uh, so that you enjoy the hunt and then you can try to kill them as quickly as possible so that they're not suffering uh, a lot. That would be great, but they can't do that. So what we would have here is a permanent emergency situation that we'd have to uh, always be allocating a tremendous amount of resources to. To which Hills can say, oh yeah, that's exactly what your theory leads to. And um, you either have to bite that bullet or uh, abandon your theory. So which is it gonna be? And that's how Hills, I think this is a, a pretty devastating objection to utilitarianism. Um, 
um, it seems that the utilitarian would be forced to either um, say that um, the vital interests of non-human animals count for much less than the interests of even the trivial interests of human beings, which is unsavory, right? Um, because then we could get to situations where somebody had a trivial interest in torturing animals. They just liked it. But then the vital interest of the animal that's being tortured counts for less than the person who's tortured. Uh, that doesn't seem uh, like it's a way to go. Or a, uh, or a utilitarian, I don't know, has to, uh, has to abandon their theory here. I'm, I'm not sure how else they could go about it. I guess they could say we are not living up to our moral obligations, but, uh, you know, we're doing the best we can. But are we doing the best we can? It seems that this would condemn us all to being immoral all the time. But again, they could say, uh, while well, the common sense is wrong and bite this bullet and say, yeah, we are obligated to do this. We should be doing it to the extent we're not. We're not living up to our moral obligations. That seems problematic. All right, so let's look at some quiz questions. So quiz question number one, why might utilitarianism not be too demanding? So here I'm uh, talking about Elizabeth Ashford's uh, defense of utilitarianism from the demandingness objection. Why might it not be too demanding? A, there's a practically realizable state of affairs in which people are not suffering so much from extreme poverty. B, the suffering of the extreme poor constitutes an emergency, and it would be crazy to think that we should ignore an emergency. Or C, both A and B. Quiz question number two. True or false? Hills ultimately argues that utilitarianism is even more demanding than it is usually thought because it implies stringent, ongoing obligations to non-human animals. Is that true or false? All right, thanks for sticking with this lecture. Uh, next time we'll be talking about Cohen and his objections to uh, animal rights theories. See you next time.